Thanks for joining us on another episode of Tea and Trout, a Penn's web series featuring conversations with archaeologists. Today, I'm joined with John Douglas. Would you like to introduce yourself and your mug? Hi, I'm John Douglas, uh, and this is my mug. It's of my wife and an old dog of ours. That's awesome. Um, I am actually round two of a narwhal mug, but this one is slightly holiday themed because there's Christmas lights run throughout all of the narwhal horns because they're the, I guess, reindeer of the sea. I don't know. It came okay. with a chocolate one year, so I just figured this would be the prime time so this should be coming out right before we break for the holidays. Um, so just getting us kicked off, uh, how did you get into archaeology? Oh, I've been interested in archaeology since I was a little kid. Um, when I was 10, my family lived in East Africa for a while. And so we went, uh, we were living in Kenya, and um, we went out to the Rift Valley and we saw the Leaky Dig. And I didn't know the difference between bioarchaeology and, and uh, archaeology itself uh, and paleontology, but uh, I knew that I was interested in it. So uh, my folks were really great about encouraging that. And so when I was in high school, I went on my first archaeological dig in New Mexico. And um, then one of the reasons why I picked where I went to college at Kenyon College in Ohio was because there were two archaeologists on the faculty. And I ended up going to Honduras with them as an undergrad and doing research and ended up uh, doing my dissertation work with them as well later on. So that's how I got my start in archaeology. I can't imagine being 10 and being able to see uh, like the Leakey's Dig and Olduvai Gorge and all of that history. Oh my goodness, I am kind of nerding out for you. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, just because I'm curious, I did uh, my field school in New Mexico in Taos. Where did you do your first archaeology dig? Uh, it was through Ghost Ranch uh, near Abiquiu, and Florence Ellis, who at, even at that point was fairly old, uh, she, back in the 30s and 40s, had uh, gotten her start at Chaco, among other places, and under, was one of the first people to really understand the ceramic chronology there. Oh. And so she led that dig. And so I spent, um, I don't remember, it was so long ago, I don't remember what site it was in New Mexico, but it was, you know, it was like an hour and a half each way from Ghost Ranch. And for many, many years, Florence Ellis would um, lead this group of volunteers from Ghost Ranch, uh, working at a variety of sites. Um, yeah, it was just an, an incredible opportunity. Yeah, it sounds, I absolutely miss the Southwest uh, doing archaeology in New Mexico. One day I'll have an archaeology vacation where I go back and just volunteer a little bit. Uh, how can you not work these days? <laughs> so, uh, what is your current research? Uh, well, I, I, do, I, I do cultural resource management. So um, I'm a vice president of a firm, Statistical Research. So I'm more of a bureaucrat these days, but uh, on the side, I do a lot of research on the colonial era. And I've gotten really interested over the last 20 years uh, with some work that we did through statistical research in Southern California on the mission period. And over the years, I've just gotten more and more interested in learning about those uh, complex webs of connection between the past and the present uh, thinking about colonialism. And as I mentioned before we got on, my wife and I are on the board of a nonprofit in Guatemala. And so I've gotten much more heavily interested in the colonial presence today in places like Guatemala. So it, it's looking at the past and the present. And, um, you know, even though I got my start on this in Southern California, my last two books have been um, uh, very more globally sort uh, or oriented in terms of in terms of the colonial experience. Oh yeah, um, especially within the Southwest, uh, Florida has the same kind of colonial history, just with the Spanish. Yeah. Uh, so if you ever make it this way, let us know. We'll give you a grand tour of the uh, scene in the works. Uh, so going into kind of field work, what is your favorite tool in your toolkit? Well, uh, I actually brought it. So uh, I've, I've got my tea right here, right? And I, I brought my trowel out just so I had tea and trowel. But um, 
This right here is my favorite tool in my toolkit. It's actually a file, and files are great to have in a toolkit for sharpening your trowel, or I used to work a lot in Belize back in graduate school, and you had to have a machete for that as well. Uh, because we were living in the jungle, we literally had to build camp in the jungle and dig our own well and dig our own latrines and everything. And having a machete was uh, an extremely important part of your toolkit and you need to have a file to be able to sharpen everything. So when I was in graduate school um, in, in Honduras doing my dissertation research, I'd had this file and my workers were always borrowing it to sharpen their shovels or their machetes or whatever. And one day, one of my workers asked to borrow my file. And when he gave it back to me, a few minutes later, he had a smile on his face. And he'd made this wooden handle for it. And so I actually tried to get the file out, and I couldn't. I think it got hammered in here. But it's, it's a great little handle for it, because it's got something you can hold on to on this end. And it protects your hand. So if you're using it on, on a machete, you're not going to cut your, cut your finger off, which is always a positive thing. And uh, I've had this uh, for about 25 years, and I just love it. Uh, I'm mildly jealous. Like, the, um, the file handles are always so short. And yeah. I can't tell you how many times I have sliced my hands open doing sharpening shovels or other things because you just slip off the handle. That's, right. That is right. one that gets passed down through generations. That's a oh, yeah. thing. It's, it's by there. far my favorite one so <laughs> um so i feel like this is going to lead some of your comments that are going to lead into this next question but what is your best worst field story those stories that you look back on and laugh about now but at the time probably weren't so laughable yeah well certainly when i worked in belize that was pretty challenging living in the middle of a rainforest and having poisonous snakes in camp or having to, you know, literally dig your own well or collect, you know, collect water for, you know, out of the lake for breakfast or whatever. But I, I think probably that one of the one of the situations that was toughest at the time was when I even before graduate school, in between undergrad and graduate school, I went back to Honduras as a crew chief, as a field supervisor. And um, we were working in the valley, the Naco Valley, which is pretty rural, or was at the time. And uh, some of our some of our crew were working on the other side of the river which was extremely remote and uh no electricity no telephones you know no nothing and if the water was high uh in the river it might be hard to cross so um they were working over there and a buddy steve and i took a truck late afternoon to go pick them up and we got across the river and we got about halfway to where our crew was um, and we got a flat. And it turns out that the truck that we had, we've always rented a whole bunch of these um, uh, Toyota 4x4 trucks that were double cab called Hilux. It's, it's kind of like the Tacomas today, but uh, for the international market. And we always got them after they'd spent five years in the uh, banana plantations along the coast. And so they would get pretty rusty from all the, you know, all the humidity and, and so forth near the coast. And so when we went to uh, lower the, the spare from underneath the, the bed, we couldn't, we couldn't get it down. It was, the chain was so rusted and entangled that we could not get the spare down. And this was before cell phones. There were no landlines on this part. You know, we were miles from any town and so we decided to split up and I was going to go the last five or 10 miles to where the crew was. And my buddy Steve was going to try to make it back to town to get another truck. And so he went off one way. I went off the other. I ended up hitching a ride on a tractor. And I don't know if you've ever ridden on a tractor if you're not driving, but there's literally no suspension on the thing. Right. And so I was sitting on one of the, the, the wells for the for the tire right like the uh yeah for the tire and um it's amazing i still have all my teeth because it would just you know you're just jumping up and down on this tractor and then i had to hitch another ride once they turned off and i walked for a while and it was getting dark 
And I finally made it to the village and my, uh, our crew's waiting there for us. And I had explained, well, I'm not quite sure when we're going to get back. And uh, several hours later, Steve showed up with another truck and we had to use the spare from that truck for the other truck so we could get both vehicles back and just pray that we didn't get another flat. But Steve ended up having to, you know, he was, a, he was a runner, but he ended up having to run like a number of miles and hitch a couple of rides, get to the highway, hitch another ride. You know, I mean, it was just insane, right? So we got back way after dark, we'd missed dinner. But I, I'm just really glad that we got back at all. So that, that in, in the scheme of things, it doesn't sound too horrible, but at the time it was, you know, pretty remote and pretty, I don't know how we're gonna get home. Yeah, these are certainly stories that like, really archeologists are the ones that have. You can't imagine like a computer science engineer or like another profession having these sorts of similar cases. Um, my last year actually going out to New Mexico for field work, um, we were doing uh, driving through Kansas and running out of gas. So we have a fleet of uh, university vans. We have two that were um, archaeology vehicles. And I will say, I always joke around that my undergrad taught me one thing the best is how to detail a car. Because uh, all the undergrads would detail these cars after every field season. And I mean, Q-tips into the vents to teach you attention to detail. Um, so those cars are great. We had one that was from a university that was like a sport vehicle, like the sports crews would use it. That one gets a flat. The same situation where the spare tire is rusted up underneath the van. So I had 15 kids in a van stuck in this gas station as we're trying to like pour coke and chip at this uh, tire underneath the car to replace the spare uh, in rural, rural Kansas. So um, people were already upset because we were parked in the gas station, like at the pump, because you can't move the car any further with that with flat tire. Um, so uh, maintain field vehicles is the thing I will always remember. And definitely checking the status of spare tires so I can not to that extent of having to run back to a town to get a spare truck um, but I can relate to finding your spare tire rusted to the bottom of the vehicle. Yeah my, my, my wife is a consultant she's a geoarchaeologist and when she's in the field we've got a dedicated four by four truck for her and um, she actually has two spares uh, one underneath and uh, there's another one attached to the front of the truck so that because uh, she doesn't she definitely cannot you know allow herself to get stuck somewhere yeah no. things you learn from previous field experiences carry with you um so our next questions are a larger question it is uh how do you think that archaeology can help save the world well you know uh, getting back to um uh some of my research with colonialism to me, when you think about the past, I, I know it sounds a little trite, but we're always bound to repeat things in the future. And so if we're able to learn something from the past to help us inform us about the future, then that's, that's gonna be really good. And I think with things like climate change or thinking about the effects, uh, you know, related sorts of things related to colonialism in terms of development and things like that, they can help inform us to think about how to relate to other people or how to uh, emerge from things like rising sea levels, which prehistoric uh, people, uh, you know, ancestral people in the past have had to deal with as well. Uh, to me, those are the sorts of things that are going to help us. May not save us, but it's certainly going to help. Yes, that's um, the help is that key word in our question because. Archaeology certainly can't really save the world, but it can certainly uh, lend a hand with its knowledge. Uh, and I would agree. I'm really interested to see how um, cities like in Florida um, are experiencing coastal squeeze as they're losing their shoreline, where those individuals are going to move to. And it's going to be almost like a pseudo city colonialist approach to invading these urban er or uh, rural areas in Florida. Uh, 
what do you do with Miami? And if you shuffle Miami back, you're in cattle country. So it's going to be really interesting to see how that <laughs> um, changes over time. Then our last uh, question is our fun one. And that is, what is keeping you sane during uh, really 2020? Well, you know, I mean, it has been tough, right? Uh, you know, I, I, I think of myself as kind of a social introvert. So I enjoy interacting with people. I enjoy, I, I so enjoy learning from my colleagues in the office and standing in doorways and chatting and learning from people that way. But I'm also one of those people that on a Saturday night, I'm totally fine staying inside reading a book or going out with friends, you know? So, so I'm not as social probably as some people are and, and it's going to affect me less in that way. But, uh, you know, one of the things that has really been difficult is just, yeah, that everyday interaction with people. And so you were telling me just before we got on that you guys are going to be releasing Sarah Her's interview with Tease and Trials today. And one of the highlights of, for me during the pandemic since probably, oh gosh, I'm going to say April or May, something like that, is most Saturdays, Sarah Her and I have walked through uh, either an historic district in Tucson or some other really interesting neighborhood. And uh, that's really been one of the highlights of my week, just because uh, my wife, Jill, and I have lived here in Tucson for 13 years. And um, during early on in the pandemic, uh, I decided it was going to be important for me to explore more of Tucson because I need to get out, I need to walk more, I need to, you know, get more exercise to work off some of this uh, stress from the pandemic. And very early on, Sarah raised her hand and said, I'd love to do that. And uh, so we've been doing it together. And um, I teach a course each fall at the University of Arizona on historic preservation and the cultural resource management field. And um, that class has really helped inform me in terms of thinking about historic districts. And I actually changed one of the exercises for the class that I teach um, from something that I wasn't quite as enamored with to uh, assigning students to pick an historic district in Tucson and read the nomination for the National Register and go visit it and write a, write a report about what they learned uh, from both the experience of walking through the neighborhood, maybe they talked to some neighbors who've lived there, what their thoughts are in that historic district, and, um, you know, and so forth. And just, you know, trying to understand something more about, about, uh, heritage and preservation here in the United States and how it can be person, personally meaningful because it's such an abstract thing, I think, to so many people, right? So, uh, so to me, that's one of the things that's really helped me in terms of uh, staying sane is getting more exercise, exploring Tucson with a great friend and colleague, and um, trying to think about how uh, to incorporate what I'm learning into my everyday life just a little bit more. Yeah, uh, it sounds awesome. And when Sarah was talking about a lot of her walks, I was like, it makes me want to visit Tucson. I've never been. So it's definitely um, after COVID and travel becomes safer, it's going to be one of my top uh, places to visit, especially checking out some of these historic districts. They seem oh, it's, it's a fantastic town. You know, I didn't know much about Tucson before we, we moved here. And um, I, I really love Tucson. It's a little gritty around the edges, which is just great. Yeah. But, um, you know, just, yeah, I mean, there's so many great things about this community here. So, I including the archaeology community, which is, which is really great here in Tucson. Yeah. No, uh, it's fantastic. And that's the end of our uh, interview. So, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us and tune in next time. And cheers. Thank you so much. Thank you.